because it's entitled Journey. I don't want you to get confused between them. And uh, I suspect there'll be something like a journey again this coming January. But that's kind of a time of intensely seeking the Lord for the upcoming year in January each year. This is talking about your life as it begins, uh, as your relationship with the Lord begins, and how um, your conversion is not the end of your journey, it's the beginning of your journey. And so we're, we're talking about uh, those aspects of um, our life with Christ. I want to read to you our text this morning from the book of Leviticus. And um, Levit- Leviticus is near the front of your Bible. We, we read some from Genesis and Exodus and some from uh, Deuteronomy. I don't think we talk about uh, Leviticus all as much as the other books of the, uh, the Pentateuch, but we're going to talk to you today from the book of Leviticus, chapter number 6. We used to listen, that preachers would listen as the page rustled. When they gave you the text, you'd listen to hear the page. Now they don't hear that. There's these little clicks as people are looking up the scripture in their telephone. But that, that will work as well. Turn with me to Leviticus chapter 6. I'm just going to draw your attention to uh, two verses of scripture. Verses 12 and 13 says, And the fire on the altar shall be kept burning on it. It shall not be put out, and the priest shall burn wood on it every morning and lay the burnt offering in order on it, and he shall burn it on, uh, burn on it the fat of the peace offerings. A fire shall always be burning on the altar. It shall never go out. And uh, with these two verses of Scripture, this is the, the book uh, Levit- Leviticus, of course, is written specifically for the Levites. You can see where it gets its name there. And so it's talking the law of Moses to the Levites on how to perform the uh, ritualistic worship in first the tabernacle, that's the tent that was erected uh, by Moses uh, to provide a place of worship for the Israelites as they traveled through the wilderness. And then later... This, the same thing was true when Solomon erected the temple that became a stone and mortar, you might say, a meeting place where worship uh, continued. And um, as the Lord spoke to the Levites, telling them what their job would be, um, of course it dealt with the daily sacrifices and the periodic uh, festivals that The Israelites would observe. But the Lord sent fire. That's that's an amazing thing that we sometimes miss out on uh, understanding. When the the tabernacle, just a tent of worship, was first erected and the house uh, and the furnishings of the house were all set in order, the Lord sent fire from heaven. This was, um, this was something that had happened previously when the Lord accepted a sacrifice. He often answered with fire. And he did that when the tabernacle was first erected and um, God sent a flame. But then he sent instruction. Now God sent the fire, but the Levites were to keep the fire burning. God gave them the fire but they had a task. They were to minister to the, to the fire. Keep the fire burning. Do not let that fire go out. The fire that God sent. And so this fire was used. If you are a student of uh, the tabernacle, you would remember that there, were, uh, there was a lampstand that gave light in the tabernacle. And uh, the fire that God sent was used to light that candlestick. And uh, 
course, there was the brazen altar. That was where the sacrifices were actually burned and offered up to the Lord. That fire was not fire that men had kindled, but it was the holy fire that God had sent from heaven. And they were to keep that fire burning, keep the fire burning. And also the incense was to be lit by the fire that God had sent. Not um, profane fire, not strange fire is one expression. But the, but the fire that God sent was to never allow, was to never be allowed to be put out. You may remember in the book of 1 Samuel when the little boy, Samuel, was dedicated to the service of the Lord, his first job was to stay in the room to keep an eye on the candlestick to make sure that that fire never went out. It was, it was the, the job of the priest, their responsibility to keep the fire burning. Now, when we begin this journey that we're talking about during this series, when we are born again, when we begin this journey, God causes a fire to break out in our heart. Now, you cannot make it break out. There's nothing you can do to earn being born again. You can, you can work for it, but it will not be successful. Uh, being born again is nothing we do. It's everything he does. By grace are we saved through faith, not of works, lest any man should boast. It is the gift of God. That's what salvation is. And, and so, in effect, a, a fire is kindled inside our heart. And we have nothing to do with lighting that flame. But we have everything to do with keeping the fire going. So when you make any trip, there are two elements that are very important for us to, to consider. If, you, if you're going into the wilderness, if you're going out into a journey, food and fire are two important aspects of that journey. Now, I'm, I, I had intended to keep things on point so it's easier for you to follow, but was not very successful in keeping my thoughts straight. So I want to just give you ground rules for listening to this message this morning. We're going to put fire, excuse me, we're going to put food and water together. When I talk about water, same thing as if I'm talking about food. These are the, these are the substances. This is our means of um, uh, nourishment, water and food that we're going to take. So, uh, and so we are discussing today the need for our journey to have provision of food and fire. Now, I have made dozens of camping expeditions into the Rocky Mountains. And um, I've stayed for weeks at a time. And I will tell you this, a person could get in trouble even in ver fairly civilized surroundings if he does not make provision. But if you go into an area where a regular vehicle, a car, will not go, a place that's too far to easily uh, get, acquire food, or a real problem is, is water. Water more than food is a problem for a person that goes into these very remote areas and camps for a week or two weeks at a time. Uh, it, it, takes, um, it takes preparation and certainly you've got to find out how to provide your need of, of, uh, of water. Um, these these um, commodities will not appear on their own. You will have to make a plan. And so when you, when you talk about water, we need more water than anything else. That's why I couldn't get away from using water separate from food. Uh, just a few pounds of food will last you for a couple of weeks, but not water because water is used so, for so many things, drinking water, of course, but cleaning and cooking and, 
there, there's just so many reasons you need to have water in those remote areas. And so it's really virtually impossible to carry enough water with you. You've got to have a plan how to find water where you are. You've got to have a plan on, in, in a lot of cases, how to, to uh, sanitize that water where it's fit for consumption. But in most areas where I've camped in the past, in some areas, the, the, the spring water has been safe enough for consumption. But in almost every area, the water is safe enough to use to clean with and, and to wash with. So, so uh, it's not that there is not an, a solution available. It's just that you've got to have a plan on how to get to it. Water's too carry uh, too heavy to put in vessels and carry to a remote place. And... Um, so you, you need to know where there's a spring or where there's a stream that can provide the water. And so th this is true in this journey that we're talking about, the spiritual journey. Um, one element to provide food and water on this journey is your own Bible. And um, I realize that there are people that are not benefited with the Bible. There are Christians around the world that do not have a Bible available to them, but you're not one of those people. Because Bibles are readily available. They're really fairly inexpensive to go to a bookstore and buy them. You can find a Bible at very low cost. Or you can generally find Bibles that are available for free. And you could probably do it any day that you wanted to, but you've got to want to. You've got to make the preparation. Get a Bible. Uh, this morning, I had a lady back in the Next Steps class uh, pull out her uh, newly acquired uh, Bible app. We mentioned a week ago or two weeks ago that, it, that it's a great free com uh, commodity. You can get, if you have a smartphone, you can get a wonderful Bible app. There's several of them available. I recommend version. How many's got the U version on your phone? Most of you do because I talk about it quite a bit. It's it's a wonderful app. Costs nothing. Go to the App Store U version. Put it in the search. It'll come up. You can download it onto your smartphone, and it has I've forgotten now how many, but it's somewhere nearly a hundred different English translations of the of the Bible that you can doubt you can read on your phone. And uh, many of those, someone would probably know the exact number, but somewhere around 20 of those are audio, uh, audio, audible, audible. You, it will play. You, you, in other words, it's recorded. You can let it play to you about 20 different versions. And um, readily available, easily get. Anybody that wants a Bible here in this, under the sound of my voice, you can get one easy and you can get it today. Get one that is yours. Um, everybody used to be proud of, I guess because of Willie Nelson, everybody used to be proud of the family Bible on the table. Well, if you've got a family Bible on the table, that's fine, but get one of your own. Yeah, I have, I don't, Willie said that Dad would read his family Bible. I have never know that I've ever seen anybody reading family Bible. I just usually have some pictures in it. So, well, I've got the wrong crowd. You guys don't know what a family Bible is. Well, talk to Willie. He'll tell you about the family Bible. But, but I want you to know you don't need a family Bible. You need a me Bible. You need one that belongs to you, one that you use daily, that you have where you can put your hand on it at any time that you keep track of yourself. You don't need another book in your house to collect dust and take up space. You need the Bible of your own to be used and used regularly. You need your own Bible. You need, it's good to have um, devotional books or study books to help you understand. But a, a wonderful thing that's available to, to us today are podcasts. Um, I'm talking about something that many of you have not scratched the surface on. Others of you use podcasts every day. 
But um, again, available to your smartphone, anybody can have podcast devotions that are downloaded to your phone. You can, you can get them every day, and there's no cost associated with them. This is a great way to have people investing in your life. Find out where the water is. Don't wait till you're thirsty before you go looking for water. Find out where the water is. Get re- you're, if you're going to go on a journey, get ready for it. Find the water is the, the first thing that you need to do. Now, when, when we are camping, And um, we've driven maybe 30, as far as 60 miles from a a town into the mountains. And um, we will take a few jugs of water, but we got to have more than what we can carry with us. And so this becomes part of our daily routine. Every day. Somebody has got to go to the water. Someone's got to go to where the source is and bring it back. If we're going to have water, you're going to have to schedule it. And if you don't do it, you will find yourself that evening, the sun goes down, the temperature goes below freezing, and now you need water, and and you've got to go try to break ice to get the water that you need. So make it your plan. Get a schedule that includes going to get water. Or, for that matter, cook. If you're going to cook, it will not happen haphazardly. You need a plan, a time when you're going to do it. And so um, this applies to our uh, getting something to eat for our soul. We, we've got to feed our bodies, but we need on this journey, we need to feed our soul as well, and I recommend that you do it first thing in the morning. Uh, you you do not have to to do this first thing in the morning to be a Christian or to to go to heaven. I'm telling you how to get there the best way. The best way would be to start every morning with your mind in tune with the Word of the Lord. Until his word is more important than anything else you're going to hear. Ladies, I know the view is waiting to talk to you every weekday morning. And some folks, maybe nobody here, but there's some folks that could not get through a day without hearing what those prophetesses on the view have to say. But I'm here to tell you that it's important that we set a priority to get our mind in tune with what the Lord is saying, even before we find out what Whoopi thinks. Start your day out getting your mind. I'm telling you how to make the best trip now. Get your mind in line with what the Lord is saying. Because what will happen to you if you don't is, not only do you miss the advantage of having the harmony of the mind of Christ operating in your life, you will get an interruption, and the first thing you'll know, the sun will be going down, the stream will be frozen over, and you won't have your water. You'll let a day pass, two days, a week, And you didn't mean to do it, but you let this important part of your life get away from you. I'm talking to you how to make your life better and how to make this journey more successful. So it's also important, and um, what we try to do is um, when we end our day, when the television screens off and the laptop is shut down to spend our last moments before we go to sleep reflecting on the Lord and what he has done we don't figure that we go through our life haphazardly we figure that the Lord is involved with our life 
that he has laid a plan out in front of us and that he, it, the things that happen to us happen on purpose, that we do not leave, live our life in happenstance. So we like to reflect last thing at night over what has happened the previous day and kind of put ourselves in a context to understand what God is doing. And if our last thoughts at night are thoughts of, de of devotion and commitment to the Lord, we find many times that the Lord speaks to us all through the night. We cannot make this happen. We, I, I'm not suggesting that you can get, you know, tuned in to where on your volition God can speak. But when we yield our thoughts to the Lord, it is no sleeping hours. By the way, uh, sleep is important physically, but, but sleep is important to your spiritual well-being as well. And many times, those hours of the night, the Lord visits you and gives you it, some dream. There are a lot of dreams that are just dreams. We, we all know that. Sometimes you have a dream, think you got an inspiration. What you got was, you know, a bad piece of pepperoni on your pizza and you did drink. That, things happen, but, but also in those latent moments when we are asleep and we are not intentionally directing our thoughts, many times the Lord is directing our thoughts right then. And so it is important that we get our mind in tune with the Lord again as we lay down to sleep at night. Now, King David, you know, King David, um, one of the greatest men that ever lived. And I know that immediately people talk about his chief failure, two, two major failures in his life. One was really significant. And uh, people bring that out when you say, well, he's one of the greatest men ever lived. But I'll tell you something, folks. Uh, that he did have a, a, tr a tremendous uh, failure, but the Lord made a covenant with David like no covenant He's ever made. How would you like for God to say to you, like He did to David, "Your son is going to be my son"? Hear that? God said to David, "Your son will be my son," and He was talking about Jesus. And so when the Bible calls Jesus the son of David, they're talking about the fulfillment of that promise that God made to David that your son will be my son. And Jesus was exactly the fulfillment of that prophecy. So I'm talking about David, the king, the, one of the greatest men who ever walked with God. And he says three times a day he makes his petition to God. Think of that. He, pray, he said, I pray three times every day. And I have set that as a goal sometimes, like during the 21-day uh, journey of January. I, I'm going to try to remember to pray three times a day. And sometimes I make that as a goal, but I don't make it, you know. Like three times, like one of them or more, I miss. I get my regular prayer time, but the other one's... David said, three times a day I make my petition. But said something else that I think is even more important than that. Three times a day he talks to God and asks God, makes his petition. But he said, seven times a day I praise God. Now there you go. I, I'm not telling you that that's what you've got to do to get to heaven. I'm talking about making your journey better. Talking to the Lord. Praying on a regular basis. Praying without ceasing. David said, I pray three times a day. But then he said, I worship the Lord. I praise him seven times a day. I lift my voice in praise to the Lord. Well, I'm talking to you about a challenge. An opportunity for us to make this journey better. Our spiritual food is the word of the Lord. Our spiritual food is our communication with him. Now, um, when you go on your camping trip to the Rocky Mountains, I know some of you have already begun 
packing now that I've been talking about this, and you can't wait to get in a very secluded place where your cell phone has no service and where you probably are going to need horseback for the last 10 or 12 miles of your trip. And so I know you're already making your plan to go. So let me add to your thinking on this. Not only do you need to make provision for what you're going to, for your intake, for your food, and for your water, but you're going to have to make a plan for fire. A person could survive if he didn't get into some very severe weather. He could survive for a while without fire. If the weather gets so bad, he's going to need fire just for survival. Um, but even when the temperatures are not that severe, fire makes life so much better. And uh, you, can, you can kindle a fire, but by the way, that's not always easy to do. Um, I was a Royal Ranger. We've got several Royal Rangers coming up in the church now. I was a Royal Ranger, and they said, we're going to learn how to rub two matches together. Excuse me, we're going to have to run, rub two stones together, or sticks together to make a uh, fire. And I said, well, you'd make sure one of them says match, and it works easier. So um, I, I, was, I was probably not the best Royal Ranger, but I, I, I did learn how to make a fire. But that fire will not keep burning on its own. Even when you get a fire, it will not burn on its own. When you make your camp, you always want to make sure you got a fire. Even if you're not going to cook on it, if you got some other way to cook, you still, the comfort of a fire, it simply defi it, 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 it defies description, the, the attraction that you have to go set at the warmth of a fire. And you, you need fire um, if you're going to make this trip. Fire has got to be sustained. In order to be sustained, it, uh, of course, it has to be ignited, but then it re requires for dry uh, fuel. It needs oxygen or air. And uh, if, if you want to keep the fire going, the fire has got to be um, stirred. And so um, I want to just tell you, first of all, that the fire of God is best maintained in a corporate setting. Um, I, 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 I know you can't believe that, that I think this crazy sometimes, but I, I, I got to tell you, I do. And I'm driving down Memorial Drive, and somebody in front of me on their bumper sticker says something. I, the, the bumper sticker says something like, the outdoors is my cathedral. And when it said that, I chased him for two miles down Memorial Drive waiting to find out if, if he had stopped. I wanted to talk to him about that bumper sticker. So you want to tell me that uh, the outdoors is your cathedral. Well, okay. I, I'm not, I'll be the last one to tell you that a person that lived a recluse situation could not live for God. I won't tell you that. I'm going to tell you what's easier. It's easier to live for God in a corporate situation. That Jesus did not die to build a community of several billion separate Christians. He died to build a church. And not just a one fellowship church. He built all the fellowship of believers around the world universally all make up one church. If Jesus was committed to the church, how do you want to look at me and say, well, I think I'll just make my cathedral the outdoors. Jesus died to build a church, corporate. That simply means that just like when you've got your little fire going and you've got two logs laying down there side by side, maybe another couple of them crossway across the top. So you've got five or six logs in there to get that thing will just burn. It creates its own uh, draft. It burns hot. It burns long. It burns thoroughly until those logs break down into coals and then ashes. 
and you can put more on top and keep the fire going. But what I'm simply telling you that the fire works better when there's several logs together. Go out and light your log and let it stand there by itself and see how it burns. I'm not telling you you can't make heaven your home if you don't go to church. I'm just telling you going to church, it makes it easier. It's better. It's better that the people of God get together. It simply works better in a corporate uh, setting. But I'll tell you something else. If you go to a church and there's no fire there, it's still going to be hard to catch you on fire. Just a little thought. I mean, it, you, it's great to go. To, but you better go where there's a little fire. If you want to get fire, you better go where the fire is. Hey, well, that's just extra. All right. You know where I come from? We had a church, and we were considered a revival church. Now, um, we were somewhere between... Um, um, eight and ten on the scale of emotionalism in our church. And, and I don't apologize for that. It, it was fine, you know. I mean, we, we had a wonderfully designed building for uh, Pentecostal church. Hallelujah. I mean, we designed it where it was easy to run in and up, up and down the aisles and out the doors. And it's fantastic. I mean, it was designed that way. I saw a man get on the back of the pew, stand up on the back of the pews and run from the front to the back because he got so excited about the touch of the Lord. Whew. He ran the whole length of the church on the back of the pews. That was, that was something. And, and um, I, I, I went to uh, a restaurant one time with some fellows that I'd gone to Bible school with. And uh, somehow the waitress found out that we were going to Bible school. She said something about, well, which one do you go to? There was two Bible colleges in the town, uh, Bible college in the town. There's Baptist Bible College, and then there was Central Bible College. And so she says, which one do you go to, BBC or CBC? We said, well, we go to CBC. And she oh, you're the Holy Rollers. And... Uh, they kind of ducked it, yeah, we're holy rollers. She said, why do they call you all holy rollers? I, I don't know why. And one of the preacher's students explains to her, said, well, they claim that back in the day some of our people would get excited in an altar service and get down on the floor and roll, but we really didn't do that. And I said, well, I don't know where you went to church, but we really did that. <laughs> um, so, I mean, I, that's emotional. I, and I, I'm not here rebuking anything. Um, I found out a long time ago that the Lord didn't send me a referee's shirt and a whistle to call people down. You know, if, if no one's getting hurt, I kind of let people express how they feel. If they, if they want to shout and they want to dance, then, boy, worship God. That's a great thing. I'll, and I'll do it with you. I mean, I've got And if you're afraid, well, now, Brother Dylan, you're just going to get somebody with wildfire. Don't even worry about that. I, I came up in a revival church. We ran the aisles. We ran on top of the pews. We rolled in the floor. And uh, we never had any wildfire that there weren't enough wet blankets around that could put it out. Yeah. So um, the, the demonstrative worship is not exactly what I'm talking about when I'm talking about fire. I'm not trying to put a lid on that. But I'm talking about fire. I'm talking about something that settles in somebody's life. And when they leave the church, then what God has done in that service that night does not leave them. And when they are confronted with a hardship, there's still a fire burning inside them that helps them confront the hardship. And when they are overtaken with uh, disappointment or a tragedy, 
They've still got a fire inside them that burns on and helps them on. When they're, as, uh, they're beset by temptation, they got fire to help them keep on the right path and do the things that are uh, conducive to what a child of God should do. So we believe in the fire. We believe in letting the fire of God burn inside our heart. Ask God for fire. Ask Him. Ask God for the touch. In, I'll tell you, um, fire is not hard to acquire. Fire is not hard to acquire. That, someone write that down. We're going to have a poster. Fire is not hard to acquire. The Bible tells us about Elijah, who prayed 64 words and called fire down out of heaven, but then prayed seven times before he could get rain. Got fire with 64 words. Fire is easier to get than rain. Um, Jesus gave us this promise. He said, if you are evil, and yet you know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? If we ask Him, we get fire. Fire comes when we ask for it. Now, there's a necessity. We need, we need the fire. Fire is beneficial for cleansing. It's beneficial for warmth. It is beneficial for ridding gar uh, garbage. And when you're out there in your journey and you are secluded and you are vulnerable, you'll find it is fire that repels the predators. Just build a fire. It'll keep the enemy out of your life. You let the fire get down in your own life, I'm talking spiritually, and you'll find out that the one who walks around like a lion and seeking whom he may devour is much more uh, likely to form an attack unless you've got a fire raging. So build the fire and let the fire burn in your life, praise God. Now, I, I, I want to tell you that your life, your victory can be better if we make the provision, food and fire. We want to be a partaker daily of the food that God has given us. We don't live by bread alone. We live by the Word of God. That's our food. And the fiery touch of the Holy Spirit is what gives us the power to live our life in victory. We'll find it's a better life when we have food and fire. Your life can be better if you have the food and the fire. Now, I, I want to challenge you and encourage you to make your plan about the food. You, you're going to have to do that on your own. You need to say, how is this going to go forward? How am I going to have nourishment for my soul? Well, you're going to have to get, you're going to make your plan. You're going to get the word. You're going to get uh, people speaking in your life. You're going to get into a place where the Lord is uh, exalted in your life. Two people will make each other sharper, just like you take two pieces of metal and rub it together. Get with somebody that is going to speak Jesus into your life. Take daily portions of food and, and let your soul uh, be built up by it. But the fire we want to talk about, there's um, ways that God has manifested uh, fire in people's lives individually, but the best way, the, the way that's been most productive has been when people are together and they call out on God for his touch in their life. And that is what we want to do today. We're going to ask God to settle down upon this congregation on this Sunday morning with a touch of the Holy Spirit that will kindle a fire inside our heart. Now, we uh, remind you of this almost every time we talk about 
stirring up the fire. But this is the uh, command that Paul shared with Timothy when he said, Timothy, I laid my hands on you once, and I, when I did, there was a Holy Spirit anointing that was imparted into your life. And so Paul said, now stir up that gift. And you may have had fire burning before, and maybe it's burning now, but I want on this opportunity today, before we were to leave this house, I want us to ask God to help us on our journey, to make us victorious in the things that we face today by imparting in us a fresh wind of His Spirit, the new anointing of the Holy Spirit, and the fire of God to burn inside our hearts today. I want that to happen. So I'm going to ask you, if you will, everybody, just stand to your feet. And um, we're, we're going to pray. We're going to ask God to do something that is powerful and mighty inside every life that's here. After I'm talking to you about that guy running across the top of the pews, I'm not suggesting any particular manifestation today, but I am saying I want you to get a touch from God today. I want everybody to have the opportunity to let a fresh fire of the Holy Spirit stir up inside us. Amen. So I'm gonna pr first I'm going to pray a conclusion to this part of the service, and we're going to move into this altar service. And if you, uh, main necessity for receiving the fire of God is a hunger for God. So I want you to stir up inside yourself. If you don't got a lot of hunger, whatever you got, stir it up today. If you got a little, stir it up. If you got a lot, stir it up. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you because you have made provision for us to live a life of victory. You've not intended for us to be the tail, but you've intended for us to be the head. You've made way that we could live this life in victory. And Some folk may have come here today depressed and discouraged, but we believe that the fire of the Lord is the cure for the trouble that they have endured. And I'm asking you, Lord, to reveal yourself in spirit and in truth here today that you would lift up the discouraged, that you would lift up the downhearted. We're praying, Lord, that there'd be a change that would take place in our life. I'm asking you, Lord, right now to help us to put aside distractions, to put aside any reservations or pride that would hold us back, and Lord, help us to wholeheartedly pursue today the fire of God to touch us in our lives. And I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, i tell you what we're going to do here this morning. I want you, if, if you need a touch from God you, and you're hungry for the fire of the Holy Spirit, just a minute, I'm going to ask you to raise up both hands. We're all going to raise up both our hands. And we're just going to say, right here, Lord, I need your fire. I need the Holy Ghost. I need your help. I recognize that to live in victory, I need the comforter to give me the help. I'm, I'm asking in Jesus' name that you give me the Holy Spirit. And we know that Jesus promised that if we would ask the Father for the Holy Spirit, He would give it to us. And we're going to receive a touch from heaven. Amen. After we have prayed in this way that I just described, if there is a special need of any kind in your life, I'm going to ask you to slip out of your seat and come up here to the front. Now we're just going to pray for you, lay hands on you, and agree.
that God's going to meet your needs. So whatever you need today, whatever you'd like prayer for, when we get to that part of this altar service, just slip out of your seat, come on up here, and we're going to believe you for whatever the thing is that you have a need of in your life. Amen. Praise the Lord. Let's raise our hands up right now. Lord, I'm hungry. I need the touch of the Holy Spirit. I want Him to give me victory in my life. Cause the fire to fall. I need the Holy Spirit today. I need His help. I need His touch. I need You to feel me now. Let the fire of heaven fall into my heart. Amen. I pray that you would stir up the fire that's burned there. In Jesus' name, give me something fresh. Give me something that's new off the altar right now. Let that fire be kindled inside my life. For Jesus' sake, I need your help. I realize I can't live the kind of victory that I need to live in except by the help of the Holy Spirit. So I'm asking for it now in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. I want you to thank you for Thank you for joining us for Church Online today at First Assembly. We pray that you were blessed and ministered to and you experienced the presence and power of God right where you are at. If you are visiting with us today, again, we'd love to connect with you. Comment below or send us a direct message, and we'd love to start that conversation. If you would like prayer, there is someone waiting by the phone to pray with you right now. Just call the number below. We'd love to pray with you, believe with you, and even hear a testimony of what God is doing in your life. Give us a call, and we'd love to talk. Thanks so much for tuning in, and we will see you soon.